Brought to you by wikivd.com Richard III of England Richard III was King of England from 1483 until his death in 1485 at the age of 32. In the Battle of Bosworth Field, he was the last King of the House of York, and the last of the Plantagenet dynasty. His defeat at Bosworth Field, the last decisive battle of the Wars of the Roses marked the end of the Middle Ages in England. He is the subject of the historical play Richard III by William Shakespeare. When his brother King Edward IV died in April 1483 Richard was named Lord Protector of the Realm. For Edward's eldest son and successor the twelve-year-old Edward V arrangements were made. For Edward's coronation on the 22nd of June 1483, but before the young king could be crowned. The marriage of his parents was declared bigamous and therefore invalid, making their children officially illegitimate and thus barring them from inheriting the throne. On the 25th of June, an assembly of lords and commoners endorsed a declaration to this effect and proclaimed Richard the rightful king. The following day Richard III began his reign, and he was crowned on 6 July 1483. The young princes Edward and his younger brother Richard, Duke of York, were not seen in public after August, and accusations circulated that the boys had been murdered on Richard's orders. There were two major rebellions against Richard. The first in October 1483 was led by staunch allies of Edward IV and Richard's former ally Henry Stafford, 2nd Duke of Buckingham. But the revolt collapsed. In August 1485, Henry Tudor and his uncle Jasper Tudor led a second rebellion. Henry Tudor landed in southern Wales, with a small contingent of French troops and marched through his birthplace Pembrokeshire, recruiting soldiers. Henry's force engaged Richard's army and defeated it. At the Battle of Bosworth Field in Leicestershire, Richard was struck down in the conflict, making him the last English king to die in battle. Henry Tudor then ascended the throne as Henry VII. After the battle Richard's corpse was taken to Leicester and buried without pomp. His original tomb monument is believed to have been removed during the English Reformation and his remains were lost for more than five centuries believed to have been thrown into the River Soar. In 2012 an archaeological excavation was commissioned by the Richard III Society on a city council car park on the site once occupied by Greyfriars Priory Church. The University of Leicester identified the skeleton found in the excavation as that of Richard III. As a result of radiocarbon dating comparison with contemporary reports of his appearance and comparison of his mitochondrial DNA with that of two matrilineal descendants of Richard III's eldest sister Anne of York, Richard's remains were reburied in Leicester Cathedral on 26 March 2015. Childhood Richard was born on 2 October 1452 at Fotheringhay Castle, the twelfth of thirteen children of Richard Plantagenet III, Duke of York, and Cecily Neville. At the beginning of what has traditionally been labelled the Wars of the Roses a period of three or four decades of political instability and periodic open civil war in the second half of the 15th century. Between supporters of Richard's father, Yorkists, in opposition to the regime of Henry VI, and his wife Margaret of Anjou and those loyal to the crown. When his father and the Nevilles were forced to flee to Ludlow in 1459, Richard and his older brother George were placed in the custody of the Duchess of Buckingham and the Archbishop of Canterbury. When his father and elder brother Edmund, Earl of Rutland, were killed, at the Battle of Wakefield on 30 December 1460 Richard, who was eight years old, and George were sent by his mother the Duchess of York to the Low Countries. They returned to England following the defeat of the Lancastrians at the Battle of Toton, 
and participated in the coronation of Richard's eldest brother as King Edward IV in June 1461. At this time Richard was named Duke of Gloucester and made a Knight of the Garter. A Knight of the Bath, he was involved in the rough politics of the Wars of the Roses from an early age. By the age of 17 he had an independent command. Richard spent several years during his childhood at Middleham Castle in Wensleydale, Yorkshire, under the tutelage of his cousin Richard Neville, 16th Earl of Warwick, who took care of his knightly training. In autumn 1465 King Edward granted the Earl £1,000 for the expenses of his younger brother's tutelage. With some interruptions Richard stayed at Midlam either from late 1461 until early 1465 when he was 12 or from 1465 until his coming of age in 1468 when he turned 16. While at Warwick's estate, he probably met Francis Lovell a strong supporter later in his life and Warwick's younger daughter, his future wife Anne Neville. It is possible that even at this early stage Warwick was considering the king's brothers as strategic matches. For his daughters Isabel and Anne, young aristocrats were often sent to be raised in the households of their intended future partners as had been the case for the young duke's father Richard of York. As the relationship between the king and Warwick became strained Edward IV opposed the match. During Warwick's lifetime, George was the only royal brother to marry one of his daughters the eldest Isabel on 12 July 1469. Without the king's permission, George joined his father-in-law's revolt against the king, while Richard remained loyal to Edward even though rumour coupled Richard's name with Anne Neville until August 1469. Richard and Edward were forced to flee to Burgundy in October 1470 after Warwick defected to the side of the former Lancastrian Queen Margaret of Anjou and for a second time Richard was forced to seek refuge in the Low Countries, which were part of the realm of the Duchy of Burgundy. In 1468, Richard's sister Margaret had married Charles the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy, and the brothers could expect a welcome there. Although only 18 years old, Richard played crucial roles in the battles of Barnet and Tewkesbury that resulted in Edward's restoration to the throne in spring 1471. During his adolescence Richard developed idiopathic scoliosis. In 2014, the osteoarchaeologist Dr. Joe Appleby of Leicester University's School of Archaeology and Ancient History imaged the spinal column and reconstructed a model using 3D printing, and concluded that though the spinal scoliosis looked dramatic, it probably did not cause any major physical deformity that could not be disguised by clothing, marriage and family relationships. Following a decisive Yorkist victory over the Lancastrians at the Battle of Tewkesbury, Richard married Anne Neville, the younger daughter of the Earl of Warwick, on 12 July 1472. By the end of 1470 Anne had previously been wedded to Edward of Westminster, only son of Henry VI, to seal her father's allegiance to the Lancastrian party. Edward died at the Battle of Tewkesbury on 4 May 1471 while Warwick had died, at the Battle of Barnet on 14 April 1471. Richard's marriage plans brought him into conflict with his brother George. John Paston's letter of 17 February 1472 makes it clear that George was not happy about the marriage but grudgingly accepted it on the basis that he may well have my lady his sister-in-law, but they shall part no livelihood. The reason was the inheritance Anne shared, with her elder sister Isabel whom George had married in 1469. It was not only the earldom that was at stake, Richard Neville had inherited it as a result of his marriage to Anne Beecham who was still alive and was technically the owner of the substantial Beecham estates, her own father having left no male heirs. The Croyland Chronicle records that Richard agreed 
to a prenuptial contract in the following terms, the marriage of the Duke of Gloucester with Anne before named was to take place and he was to have such and so much of the Earl's lands as should be agreed upon between them through the mediation of arbitrators, while all the rest were to remain in the possession of the Duke of Clarence. The date of Paston's letter suggests the marriage was still being negotiated in February 1472, in order to win his brother George's final consent to the marriage. Richard renounced most of Warwick's land and property, including the earldoms of Warwick and Salisbury and surrendered to Clarence the office of Great Chamberlain of England. While he retained Neville's forfeit estates he had already been granted in the summer of 1471. Penrith Sheriff Hutton and Middleham where he later established his marital household. The requisite papal dispensation was obtained dated the 22nd of April 1472. Michael Hicks has suggested that the terms of the dispensation deliberately understated the degrees of consanguinity between the couple, and the marriage was therefore illegal on the ground of first-degree consanguinity following Georges' marriage to Anne's sister Isabel. First-degree consanguinity applied in the case of Henry VIII and his brother's widow Catherine of Aragon. In their case the papal dispensation was obtained after Catherine declared the first marriage had not been consummated. In Richard's case, there would have been first-degree consanguinity if Richard had sought to marry Isabel after she had married his brother George but no such consanguinity applied. For Anne and Richard, Richard's marriage to Anne was never declared null and it was public to everyone including secular and canon lawyers for 13 years. In June 1473, Richard persuaded his mother-in-law to leave sanctuary and come to live under his protection at Middleham. Later in the year under the terms of the 1473 Act of Resumption, George lost some of the property he held under royal grant and made no secret of his displeasure. John Paston's letter of November 1473 says that the king planned to put both his younger brothers in their place by acting as a stifler between them. Early in 1474 Parliament assembled and King Edward attempted to reconcile his brothers by stating that both men and their wives would enjoy the Warwick inheritance just as if the Countess of Warwick was naturally dead. The doubts cast by Clarence on the validity of Richard and Anne's marriage were addressed by a clause protecting their rights in the event they were divorced and then legally remarried to each other and also protected Richard's rights while waiting for such a valid second marriage with Anne. The following year Richard was rewarded with all the Neville lands in the north of England at the expense of Anne's cousin George Neville. From this point George seems to have fallen steadily out of King Edward's favour, his discontent coming to a head in 1477 when following Isabel's death he was denied the opportunity to marry Mary of Burgundy the stepdaughter of his sister Margaret. Even though Margaret approved the proposed match, there is no evidence of Richard's involvement in George's subsequent conviction, an execution on a charge of treason estates and titles. Richard was granted the Duchy of Gloucester on 1 November 1461, and on 12 August the next year was awarded large estates in northern England, including the lordships of Richmond, Indiana, Yorkshire and Pembroke in Wales. He gained the forfeited lands of the Lancastrian John de Vere Earl of Oxford in East Anglia. In 1462 on his birthday he was made Constable of Gloucester and Corf Castles, and Admiral of England, Ireland and Aquitaine and appointed Governor of the North, becoming the richest and most powerful noble in England. On 17 October 1469, he was made Constable of England. In November he replaced William Hastings I Baron Hastings as Chief Justice of North Wales. The following year he was appointed Chief Steward and Chamberlain of Wales.
On 18 May 1471 Richard was named Great Chamberlain and Lord High Admiral of England. Other positions followed, High Sheriff of Cumberland for life, Lieutenant of the North and Commander-in-Chief against the Scots, and Hereditary Warden of the West March. Two months later on 14 July, he gained the lordships of the stronghold Sheriff Hutton and Middleham in Yorkshire and Penrith in Cumberland which had belonged to Warwick the Kingmaker. It is possible that the grant of Middleham seconded Richard's personal wishes. However, any personal attachment he may have felt to Middleham was likely mitigated in his adulthood. As surviving records demonstrate he spent less time there than at Barnard Castle in Pontefract. Exile and Return during the latter part of the reign of Edward IV, Richard demonstrated his loyalty in contrast to their brother George, who had allied himself with Warwick through the 1460s and threw in his lot with the Earl when the latter rebelled at the end of the decade, following Warwick's 1470 rebellion, in which he made peace with Margaret of Anjou and promised the restoration of Henry VI. To the English throne Richard William Lord Hastings and Anthony Woodville. Earl Rivers escaped capture at Doncaster by Warwick's brother Lord Montague. On 2 October they sailed from King's Lynn in two ships. Edward landed at Marsdeep and Richard at Zealand. It was said that having left England in such haste as to possess almost nothing, Edward was forced to pay their passage with his fur cloak. Certainly Richard borrowed three pounds from Zealand's town bailiff. They were attainted by Warwick's only parliament on 26 November. They resided in Bruges with Louis de Grathews who had been the Burgundian ambassador to Edward's court but it was not until Louis XI of France declared war on Burgundy that Charles Duke of Burgundy assisted their return providing along with the Hanseatic merchants 20,000 pounds, 36 ships and 1,200 men. They departed Flushing for England on the 11th of March 1471. Warwick's arrest of local sympathizers prevented them from landing in York East Anglia. And on 14 March after being separated in a storm their ships ran ashore at Holderness. The town of Hull refused him entry and Edward gained entry to York by using the same claim as Henry of Bolingbroke had before deposing Richard II in 1399, viz. that he was merely reclaiming the dukedom of York rather than the crown. It was in Edward's attempt to regain his throne that Gloucester began to demonstrate his skill as a military commander. 1471 Military Campaign Once Edward had regained the support of Clarence he mounted a swift and decisive campaign to regain the crown through combat. It is believed that Richard was his principal lieutenant as some of the king's earliest support came from members of Richard's affinity including Sir James Harrington and Sir William Parr, who brought 600 men-at-arms to them at Doncaster. He may have led the vanguard at the Battle of Barnet in his first command on 14 April 1471, where he outflanked the Duke of Exeter's wing although the degree to which his command was fundamental may have been exaggerated. That his personal household sustained losses indicates he was in the thick of the fighting. A contemporary source is clear about his holding the vanguard for Edward at Tewkesbury deployed against the Lancastrian vanguard under the Duke of Somerset on 4 May 1471, and his role two days later as Constable of England sitting alongside John Howard as Earl Marshal, in the trial and sentencing of leading Lancastrians captured after the battle. 1475 Invasion of France at least in part resentful of the French king's previous support of his Lancastrian opponents, and possibly in support of his brother-in-law Charles the Bold Duke of Burgundy Edward went to Parliament in October 1472 for funding a military campaign.
and eventually landed in Calais on 4 July 1475. Gloucester's was the largest private contingent of his army. Although well known to have publicly been against the eventual treaty signed with Louis XI at Piquigny, he acted as Edward's witness when the king instructed his delegates to the French court, and received some very fine presents from Louis on a visit to the French king at Amiens in refusing other gifts which included pensions in the guise of tribute. He was joined only by Cardinal Boucher. He supposedly disapproved of Edward's policy of personally benefiting, politically and financially, from a campaign paid for out of a parliamentary grant, and hence out of public funds. Any military prowess was therefore not to be revealed further until the last years of Edward's reign. Council of the North Richard controlled the north of England until Edward IV's death. There, and especially in the city of York, he was highly regarded, although it has been questioned whether this view was reciprocated by Richard. Edward IV set up the Council of the North as an administrative body in 1472 to improve government control and economic prosperity and benefit the whole of Northern England. Kendall and later historians have suggested that this was with the intention of making Richard the Lord of the North. Peter Booth, however, has argued that, instead of allowing his brother the Duke of Gloucester carte blanche, Edward restricted his influence by using his own agent Sir William Parr. Richard served as its first Lord President from 1472 until his accession to the throne. On his accession he made his nephew John de la Pole first Earl of Lincoln President, and formally institutionalized it as an offshoot of the Royal Council, all its letters and judgments were issued on behalf of the King and in his name. The Council had a budget of 2,000 marks per annum and had issued regulations by July of that year, councillors to act impartially and declare vested interests and to meet at least every three months. Its main focus of operations was Yorkshire and the North East, and its primary responsibilities were land disputes keeping of the King's peace and punishing lawbreakers. War with Scotland Richard's increasing role in the North from the mid-1470s to some extent explains his withdrawal from the royal court. He had been warden of the West March on the Scottish border since 10 September 1470 and again from May 1471. He used Penrith as a base while taking effectual measures against the Scots and enjoyed the revenues of the estates of the Forest of Cumberland while doing so. It was, at the same time that the Duke was appointed Sheriff of Cumberland five consecutive years, being described as, of Penrith Castle, in 1478. By 1480 war with Scotland was looming. On 12 May that year he was appointed Lieutenant General of the North as fears of a Scottish invasion grew. Louis XI of France had attempted to negotiate a military alliance with Scotland, with the aim of attacking England according to a contemporary French chronicler. Richard had the authority to summon the border levies and issue commissions of array to repel the border raids. Together with the Earl of Northumberland he launched counter-raids and when the King and Council formally declared war in November 1480, he was granted £10,000 for wages. The King failed to arrive to lead the English army, and the result was intermittent skirmishing until early 1482. Richard witnessed the treaty, with Alexander Duke of Albany brother of the Scottish King James III. Northumberland Stanley, Dorset Sir Edward Woodville and Richard with approximately 20,000 men took the town of Berwick almost immediately. The castle held until 24 August 1482 when Richard recaptured Berwick upon Tweed from the Kingdom of Scotland, although it is debatable whether the English victory was due more to internal Scottish divisions rather than any outstanding military prowess by Richard.
It was the last time that the royal borough of Berwick changed hands between the two realms. King of England on the death of Edward IV on the 9th of April 1483, his 12-year-old son Edward V succeeded him. Richard was named Lord Protector of the Realm and at William Hastings' urging. Richard assumed his role and left his base in Yorkshire for London. As previously agreed, on the 29th of April Richard, who was joined on the route by his cousin the Duke of Buckingham, met Queen Elizabeth's brother Anthony Woodville's second Earl Rivers at Northampton while he was escorting Edward at the Queen's request to London with an armed escort of 2,000 men while Richard and Buckingham's joint escort was of 600 men. However the young king himself had been sent further south to Stony Stratford. At first convivial, Richard had Earl Rivers, his nephew Richard Gray, and his associate Thomas Vaughan arrested. They were taken to Pontefract Castle, where they were executed on 25 June on the charge of treason against the Lord Protector after appearing before a tribunal led by Henri Percy, 4th Earl of Northumberland. Rivers appointed Richard as executor of his will. After having Lord Rivers arrested, the two dukes moved to Stony Stratford where Richard informed the young king of a plot aimed at denying him his role as protector whose perpetrators had been dealt with. He proceeded to escort the young king to London, where they entered on the 4th of May displaying the carriages of weapons Earl Rivers had taken with his 2,000-man army. Richard first accommodated Edward in the bishop's apartments then, on the Duke of Buckingham's suggestion in the royal apartments of the Tower of London, where kings customarily awaited their coronation. On hearing the news of her brother's arrest on 30 April the Dowager Queen fled to sanctuary in Westminster Abbey together with her son by her first marriage Thomas Grey. First Marquess of Dorset, her five daughters and her youngest son Richard, Duke of York. On 16 June Elizabeth Woodville agreed to hand over the younger prince to the Archbishop of Canterbury so that he might attend his brother Edward's coronation. Still planned for the 22nd of June. On 10 11 June Richard wrote to Ralph Lord Neville the city of York and others asking for their support against the Queen, her blood adherents and affinity, whom he suspected of plotting his murder. At a council meeting on 13 June at the Tower of London, Richard accused Hastings and others of having conspired against him with the Woodvilles, with Jane Shaw lover to both Hastings and Thomas Gray acting as a go-between. According to Thomas More Hastings was taken out of the council chambers and summarily executed in the courtyard while others like Lord Thomas Stanley and Bishop Morton were arrested. Hastings was not attainted, and Richard sealed an indenture that placed Hastings' widow Catherine directly under his own protection. John Morton Bishop of Ely one of those arrested was released into the custody of Buckingham before the latter's rebellion. A clergyman is said to have informed Richard that Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was invalid because of Edward's earlier union with Eleanor Butler making Edward V and his siblings illegitimate. The identity of the informant is known only through the memoirs of French diplomat Philippe de Commons as Robert Stillington, the Bishop of Bath and Wells. On the 22nd of June 1483, a sermon was preached outside Old St. Paul's Cathedral declaring Edward's children bastards and Richard the rightful king. Shortly after the citizens of London, both nobles and commons, convened and drew up a petition asking Richard to assume the throne. He accepted on the 26th of June, and was crowned at Westminster Abbey on the 6th of July 1483. His title to the throne was confirmed by Parliament in January 1484 by the document Titulus Regis. The princes, who were still lodged in the royal residence of the Tower of London, at the time of Richard's coronation disappeared from sight after the summer of 1483.
Although Richard III has been accused of having Edward and his brother killed, there is debate about their actual fate. After the coronation ceremony Richard and Anne set out on a royal progress to meet their subjects. During this journey through the country the King and Queen endowed King's College and Queen's College at Cambridge University and made grants to the church. Still feeling a strong bond with his northern estates, Richard later planned the establishment of a large chantry chapel in York Minster with over 100 priests. Richard also founded the College of Arms Rebellion of 1483 in 1483 a conspiracy arose among a number of disaffected gentry, many of whom had been supporters of Edward IV and the whole Yorkist establishment. The conspiracy was nominally led by Richard's former ally, and first cousin once removed Henry Stafford second Duke of Buckingham. Although it had begun as a Woodville Beaufort conspiracy, Indeed, Davies has suggested that it was only the subsequent parliamentary attainder that placed Buckingham at the centre of events. In order to blame a single disaffected magnate motivated by greed rather than the embarrassing truth that those opposing Richard were actually overwhelmingly Edwardian loyalists, it is possible that they planned to depose Richard III and place Edward V back on the throne and that when rumours arose that Edward and his brother were dead Buckingham proposed that Henry Tudor should return from exile, take the throne and marry Elizabeth of York, elder sister of the Tower Princes. However, it has also been pointed out that as this narrative stems from Richard's own Parliament of 1484, it should probably be treated with caution. For his part Buckingham raised a substantial force, from his estates in Wales and the Marches. Henry, in exile in Brittany, enjoyed the support of the Breton treasurer Pierre Landais, who hoped Buckingham's victory would cement an alliance between Brittany and England. Some of Henry Tudor's ships ran into a storm and were forced to return to Brittany and Normandy while Henry himself anchored off Plymouth for a week before learning of Buckingham's failure. Buckingham's army was troubled by the same storm and deserted, when Richard's forces came against them. Buckingham tried to escape in disguise, but was either turned in by a retainer for the bounty Richard had put on his head, or was discovered in hiding with him. He was convicted of treason and beheaded in Salisbury, near the Bull's Head Inn on 2 November. His widow Catherine Woodville later married Jasper Tudor, the uncle of Henry Tudor who was in the process of organising another rebellion. Richard made overtures to Landace offering military support for Landace's weak regime under Duke Francis II of Brittany in exchange for Henry. Henry fled to Paris where he secured support from the French regent Anne of Beaujeu who supplied troops for an invasion in 1485. The French government, recalling Richard's effective disowning of the Treaty of Piquigny and refusal to accept the accompanying French pension would not have welcomed the accession of one known to be unfriendly to France. Death at the Battle of Bosworth Field on the 22nd of August 1485 Richard met the outnumbered forces of Henry Tudor. At the Battle of Bosworth Field, Richard rode a white courser. The size of Richard's army has been estimated at 8,000 and Henry's at 5,000. But exact numbers are not known. All that can be said is that the royal army substantially outnumbered Tudors. The traditional view of the king's famous cries of treason, before falling was that during the battle Richard was abandoned by Lord Stanley Sir William Stanley and Henry Percy, 4th Earl of Northumberland. However, the role of Northumberland is unclear, his position was with the reserve behind the king's line, and he could not easily have moved forward without a general royal advance which did not take place. Indeed, the physical confines behind the crest of Ambien Hill combined with the difficulty of communications, 
probably physically hampered any attempt he made to join the fray. Despite appearing a pillar of the Ricardian regime and his previous loyalty to Edward IV Lord Stanley's wife, Lady Margaret Beaufort was Henry Tudor's mother and Stanley's inaction combined with his brothers entering the battle on Tudor's behalf was fundamental to Richard's defeat. The death of John Howard, Duke of Norfolk, his close companion, may have had a demoralizing effect on Richard and his men. Either way, Richard led a cavalry charge deep into the enemy ranks in an attempt to end the battle quickly by striking at Henry Tudor himself. Accounts note that King Richard fought bravely and ably during this maneuver unhorsing Sir John Cheney, a well-known jousting champion, killing Henry's standard bearer Sir William Brandon, and coming within a sword's length of Henry Tudor before being surrounded by Sir William Stanley's men and killed. The Burgundian chronicler Jean Molinet says that a Welshman struck the death blow with a halberd while Richard's horse was stuck in the marshy ground. It was said that the blows were so violent that the king's helmet was driven into his skull. The contemporary Welsh poet Gutor Glyn implies a leading Welsh Lancastrian Resap Thomas, or one of his men killed the king writing that he killed the boar shaved his head. The identification in 2013 of King Richard's body shows that the skeleton had eleven wounds, eight of them to the skull clearly inflicted in battle and suggesting he had lost his helmet. Professor Guy Rutty from the University of Leicester said, the most likely injuries to have caused the king's death are the two, to the inferior aspect of the skull, a large sharp force trauma possibly from a sword or staff weapon such as a halberd, a bill and a penetrating injury from the tip of an edged weapon. The skull showed that a blade had hacked away part of the rear of the skull. Richard III was the last English king to be killed in battle. Polydor Virgil, Henry Tudor's official historian recorded that King Richard alone was killed fighting manfully in the thickest press of his enemies. Richard's naked body was then carried back to Leicester tied to a horse, and early sources strongly suggest that it was displayed in the collegiate church of the Annunciation of Our Lady of the Newark prior to being buried at Greyfriars Church in Leicester. In 1495 Henry VII paid £50 for a marble and alabaster monument. According to a discredited tradition during the dissolution of the monasteries, his body was thrown into the river Saw, although other evidence suggests that a memorial stone was visible in 1612, in a garden built on the site of Greyfriars. The exact location was then lost owing to more than 400 years of subsequent development, until archaeological investigations in 2012 revealed the site of the garden and Greyfriars Church. There was a memorial ledger stone in the choir of the cathedral, since replaced by the tomb of the king and a stone plaque on Bow Bridge, where tradition had falsely suggested that his remains had been thrown into the river. According to another tradition, Richard consulted a seer in Leicester before the battle who foretold that where your spur should strike on the ride into battle your head shall be broken on the return. On the ride into battle his spur struck the bridge stone of Bow Bridge in the city. Legend states that as his corpse was carried from the battle over the back of a horse, his head struck the same stone and was broken open. Henry Tudor succeeded Richard to become Henry VII and sought to cement the succession by marrying the Yorkist heiress Elizabeth of York, Edward IV's daughter and Richard III's niece. Succession Richard and Anne had one son born between 1474 and 1476, Edward of Middleham, who was created Earl of Salisbury on 15 February 1478. He died in April 1484 after being created Prince of Wales on 8 September the previous year, and only two months after formally being declared heir apparent.
Richard also had two acknowledged illegitimate children, John of Gloucester, who was appointed captain of Calais in 1485, and Catherine Plantagenet, who married William Herbert, second Earl of Pembroke in 1484. Neither their birth dates nor the names of their mothers are documented, but since Catherine was old enough to be wedded in 1484 and John was old enough to be knighted in September 1483 in York Minster and to be made Captain of Calais in March 1485. Most historians agree that they were father during Richard's teen years. There is no trace of infidelity on Richard's part after his marriage to Anne Neville in 1472 when he was around 20 hence the suggestion by A.L. Rouse that Gloucester had no interest in sex. Michael Hicks and Josephine Wilkinson have suggested that Catherine's mother may have been Catherine Oate, on the basis of the grant of an annual payment of 100 shillings made to her in 1477. The Oate family was related to the Woodvilles through the marriage of Elizabeth Woodville's aunt. Joan Woodville to Sir William Oate. One of their children was Richard Oate, controller of the prince's household. Their daughter Alice married Sir John Fogg. They were ancestors to Queen Consort Catherine Parr, sixth wife of King Henry VIII. They also suggest that John's mother may have been Alice Borough. Richard visited Pontefract from 1471 in April and October 1473 and in early March 1474 for a week. On 1 March 1474, he granted Alice Borough £20 a year for life for certain special causes and considerations. She later received another allowance apparently for being engaged as nurse for Clarence's son, Edward of Warwick. Richard continued her annuity when he became king. John Ashdown Hill has suggested that John was conceived during Richard's first solo expedition to the eastern counties in the summer of 1467 at the invitation of John Howard, and that the boy was born in 1468 and named after his friend and supporter. Richard himself noted John was still a minor, when he issued the royal patent appointing him Captain of Calais on of March 1485, possibly on his 17th birthday. Both of Richard's illegitimate children survived him, but they seem to have died without issue and their fate after Richard's demise. At Bosworth is not certain. John received a £20 annuity from Henry VII but there are no mentions of him in contemporary records after 1487. He may have been executed in 1499, though no record of this exists beyond an assertion by George Buck over a century later. Catherine apparently died before her cousin Elizabeth of York's coronation on 25 November 1487. Since her husband Sir William Herbert is described as a widower by that time, Catherine's burial place was located in the London Parish Church of St. James Garlic Hith, between Skinner's Lane and Upper Thames Street. The mysterious Richard Plantagenet, who was first mentioned in Francis Peck's Desiderata Curiosa, was said to be a possible illegitimate child of Richard III and is sometimes referred to as Richard the master builder a Richard of Eastwell, but it has also been suggested he could have been Richard Duke of York, one of the missing princes in the tower. He died in 1550, at the time of his last stand against the Lancastrians. Richard was a widower without a legitimate son. After his son's death, he had initially named his nephew Edward Earl of Warwick Clarence's young son and the nephew of Queen Anne Neville as his heir. After Anne's death, however, Richard named another nephew John de Lepole, Earl of Lincoln, the son of his elder sister Elizabeth. However, he was also negotiating with John II of Portugal to marry his sister Joanna, a pious young woman who had already turned down several suitors because of her preference for the religious life. Legacy Richard's Council of the North described as his one major institutional innovation derived 
from his ducal council following his own viceregal appointment by Edward IV. When Richard himself became king he maintained the same conciliar structure in his absence. It officially became part of the royal council machinery under the presidency of John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln in April 1484 based at Sandal Castle in Wakefield. It is considered to have greatly improved conditions for Northern England as it was in theory at least intended to keep the peace and punish lawbreakers as well as resolving land disputes bringing regional governance directly under the control of central government. It has been described as the king's most enduring monument surviving unchanged until 1641. In December 1483 Richard instituted what later became known as the Court of Requests a Court, to which poor people who could not afford legal representation could apply for their grievances to be heard. He also improved bail in January 1484 to protect suspected felons from imprisonment before trial and to protect their property from seizure during that time. He founded the College of Arms in 1484, he banned restrictions on the printing and sale of books, and he ordered the translation of the written laws and statutes from the traditional French into English. He ended the arbitrary benevolences made it punishable to conceal from a buyer of land that a part of the property had already been disposed of. To somebody else required that land sales be published lay down property qualifications. For jurors restricted the abusive courts of pie powders regulated cloth sales instituted certain forms of trade protectionism prohibited the sale of wine and oil in fraudulent measure and prohibited fraudulent collection of clergy dues among others. Churchill implies he improved the law of trusts. Richard's death at Bosworth resulted in the end of the Plantagenet dynasty which had ruled England. Since the succession of Henry II in 1154, the last legitimate male Plantagenet Richard's nephew, Edward Earl of Warwick was executed by Henri VII in 1499. However an agnatic, but illegitimate male line still exists today with the current Duke of Beaufort. Reputation There are numerous contemporary and near-contemporary sources of information about the reign of Richard III. These include the Croyland Chronicle, Comina's Memoirs, the Report of Dominic Mancini, the Past in Letters, the Chronicles of Robert Fabian, and numerous court and official records, including a few letters by Richard himself. However, the debate about Richard's true character and motives continues both because of the subjectivity of many of the written sources, reflecting the generally partisan nature of writers of this period and because of the fact that none was written by men with an intimate knowledge of Richard, even if they had met him in person. During Richard's reign, the historian John Rouse praised him as a good lord who punished oppressors of the commons, adding that he had a great heart. In 1483 the Italian observer Mancini reported to Angelo Catho, Archbishop of Vienne, France, that Richard enjoyed a good reputation and that both his private life and public activities powerfully attracted the esteem of strangers. His bond to the city of York in particular was such that on hearing of Richard's demise, at the Battle of Bosworth the city council officially deplored the king's death at the risk of facing the victor's wrath. During his lifetime he was the subject of some attacks. Even in the north in 1482 a man was prosecuted for offences against the Duke of Gloucester, saying he did nothing but grin at the city of York. In 1484 the discreditary actions took the form of hostile placards the only surviving one being William Collingbourne's Lampoon of July 1484 The Cat the Rat and Lovell the Dog all rule England under a hog which was pinned to the door of Street Paul's Cathedral and referred to the King himself and his most trusted counsellors William Catesby, Richard Ratcliffe and Francis Viscount Lovell.
On 30 March 1485 Richard felt forced to summon the Lords and London city councillors to publicly deny the rumours that he had poisoned Queen Anne and that he had planned a marriage to his niece Elizabeth at the same time ordering the Sheriff of London to imprison anyone spreading such slanders. The same orders were issued throughout the realm, including York, where the royal pronouncement recorded in the city records dates 5 April 1485, and carries specific instructions to suppress seditious talk and remove and destroy evidently hostile placards unread. As for Richard's physical appearance, most contemporary descriptions bear out the evidence that aside from having one shoulder higher, then the other Richard had no other noticeable bodily deformity. John Stowe talked to her old men who, remembering him said that he was of bodily shape comely enough only of low stature, and a German traveller Nicholas von Popoli who spent ten days in Richard's household in May 1484, describes him as three fingers taller than himself dock much more lean with delicate arms and legs, and also a great heart. Six years after Richard's death in 1491, a schoolmaster named William Burton on hearing a defense of Richard launched into a diatribe, accusing the dead king of being a hypocrite and a crookback. Who was deservedly buried in a ditch like a dog, Richard's death encouraged the furtherance of this later negative image by his Tudor successes due to the fact that it helped to legitimize Henry VII's seizure of the throne. The Richard III Society contends that this means that a lot of what people thought they knew about Richard III was pretty much propaganda and myth-building. The Tudor characterization culminated in the famous fictional portrayal of him. In Shakespeare's play Richard III is a physically deformed Machiavellian villain albeit courageous and witty cheerfully committing numerous murders in order to claw his way to power. Shakespeare's intention, perhaps being to use Richard III as a vehicle for creating his own Marlowe-esque protagonist, Rouse himself in his History of the Kings of England. Written during Henry VII's reign initiated the process. He reversed his earlier position and now portrayed Richard as a freakish individual who was born with teeth and shoulder-length hair after having been in his mother's womb for two years. His body was stunted and distorted with one shoulder higher than the other and he was slight in body and weak in strength. Rouse also attributes the murder of Henry VI to Richard and claims that he poisoned his own wife. Jeremy Potter, a former chair of the Richard III Society, claims that, at the bar of history Richard III continues to be guilty because it is impossible to prove him innocent. The Tudors ride high in popular esteem, Polydor Virgil and Thomas More expanded on this portrayal, emphasizing Richard's outward physical deformities as a sign of his inwardly twisted mind. Moore describes him as little of stature ill-featured of limbs crook-backed, hard-favored of visage. Virgil also says he was deformed of body, one shoulder higher than the right. Both emphasize that Richard was devious and flattering. While planning the downfall of both his enemies and supposed friends, Richard's good qualities were his cleverness and bravery. All these characteristics are repeated by Shakespeare who portrays him as having a hunch, a limp and a withered arm. With regard to the hunch, the second quarto edition of Richard III used the term hunched backed, but in the first folio edition it became bunch backed. Richard's reputation as a promoter of legal fairness persisted however. William Camden in his Remains Concerning Britain states that Richard, albeit he lived wickedly, made good laws. Francis Bacon also states that he was a good lawmaker for these and solace of the common people. In 1525 Cardinal Wolsey upbraided the alderman and mayor of London for relying on a statute of Richard to avoid paying an extorted tax, but received the reply, although he did evil, yet in his time were many good acts made. Despite this, 
The image of Richard as a ruthless power grabber remained dominant in the 18th and 19th centuries. David Hume described him as a man who used dissimulation to conceal his fierce and savage nature, and who had abandoned all principles of honor and humanity. Hume acknowledges that some historians have argued that he was well qualified for government had he legally obtained it, and that he committed no crimes but such as were necessary to procure him possession of the crown. But he dismisses this view on the grounds that Richard's exercise of arbitrary power encouraged instability. The most important late 19th century biographer of the king was James Gardner, who also wrote the entry on Richard in the Dictionary of National Biography. Gardner stated that he had begun to study Richard with a neutral viewpoint, but became convinced that Shakespeare and Moore were essentially correct in their view of the king. Despite some exaggerations, Richard was not without his defenders, the first of whom was George Buck, a descendant of one of the king's supporters, whose life of Richard was completed in 1619. Buck attacked the improbable imputations and strange, and spiteful scandals related by Tudor writers including the alleged deformities and murders. He located lost archival material including the titulus regis but also claimed to have seen a letter written by Elizabeth of York according to which Elizabeth sought to marry the king, though the book was published in 1646. Elizabeth's supposed letter was never produced. Documents which later emerged from the Portuguese royal archives show that after Queen Anne's death, Richard's ambassadors were sent on a formal errand to negotiate a double marriage between Richard and the Portuguese king's sister Jonah of Lancastrian descent and between Elizabeth of York and Joanna's cousin Duke Manuel. The most significant of Richard's defenders was Horace Walpole in historic doubts on the life and reign of King Richard III. Walpole disputed all the alleged murders and argued that Richard may have acted in good faith. He also argued that any physical abnormality was probably no more than a minor distortion of the shoulders. However, he retracted his views in 1793 after the terror stating he now believed that Richard could have committed the crimes he was charged with Although Pollard observes that this retraction is frequently overlooked by later admirers of Richard, other defenders of Richard include the noted explorer Clements Markham whose Richard III, his life and character replied to the work of Gardner. He argued that Henry VII killed the princes, and that evidence of other crimes was nothing more than rumor and propaganda. An intermediate view was provided by Alfred Legg in The Unpopular King. Legg argued that Richard's greatness of soul was eventually warped and dwarfed by the ingratitude of others. Some 20th century historians have been less inclined to moral judgment seeing Richard's actions as a product of the unstable times. In the words of Charles Ross, the later 15th century in England is now seen as a ruthless and violent ages concerns the upper ranks of society full of private feuds, intimidation, land hunger and litigiousness and consideration of Richard's life and career against this background has tended to remove him from the lonely pinnacle of villainy incarnate on which Shakespeare had placed him. Like most men, he was conditioned by the standards of his age. The Richard III Society founded in 1924 as the Fellowship of the White Boar is the oldest of several groups dedicated to improving his reputation. Other contemporary historians still describe him as a power-hungry and ruthless politician who was still most probably ultimately responsible for the murder of his nephews. In culture Apart from Shakespeare, Richard appears in many other works of literature. Two other plays of the Elizabethan era predated Shakespeare's work. The Latin language drama Richard is Tertius by Thomas Legg is believed to be the first history play written in England. The anonymous play The True Tragedy of Richard III, 
performed in the same decade as Shakespeare's work was probably an influence on Shakespeare. Neither of the two plays places any emphasis on Richard's physical appearance. Though the true tragedy briefly mentions that he is a man ill-shaped, crooked-backed, lame-armed, adding that he is valiantly minded but tyrannous in authority. Both portray him as a man motivated by personal ambition who uses everyone around him to get his way. Ben Jonson is also known to have written a play Richard Crook back in 1602, but it was never published and nothing is known about its portrayal of the king. Marjorie Bowen's 1929 novel Dickens set the trend for pro-Ricardian literature. Particularly influential was The Daughter of Time by Josephine Tay, in which a modern detective concludes that Richard III is innocent in the death of the princes. Other novelists such as Valerie Anand in the novel Crown of Roses have also offered alternative versions to the theory that he murdered them. Sharon K. Penman in her historical novel The Sun in Splendor attributes the death of the princes to the Duke of Buckingham. In the mystery novel The Murders of Richard III, by Elizabeth Peters the central plot revolves around the debate as to whether Richard III was guilty of these and other crimes. A sympathetic portrayal of Richard III is given in The Founding, the first volume in the Moreland Dynasty series by Cynthia Harrod Eagles. One film adaptation of Shakespeare's play Richard III is the 1955 version directed and produced by Laurence Olivier who also played the lead role. Also notable are the 1995 film version starring Ian McKellen, set in a fictional 1930s fascist England and looking for Richard a 1996 documentary film directed by Al Pacino who plays the title character as well as himself. The play has been adapted for television on several occasions. Discovery of Remains On 24 August 2012 the University of Leicester and Leicester City Council, in association with the Richard III Society announced that they had joined forces to begin a search for the remains of King Richard. The search for Richard III was led by Philippa Langley of the Society's Looking for Richard project with the archaeological work led by University of Leicester Archaeological Services. Experts set out to locate the lost site of the former Greyfriars Church and to discover whether his remains were still interred there by comparing fixed points between maps in a historical sequence. The search located the Church of the Greyfriars where Richard's body had been hastily buried without pomp in 1485. Its foundations identifiable beneath a modern-day city centre car park. On 5 September 2012, the excavators announced that they had identified Greyfriars Church, and two days later that they had identified the location of Robert Herrick's garden, where the memorial to Richard III stood in the early 17th century. A human skeleton was found beneath the church's choir. Improbably, the excavators found the remains in the first location in which they dug at the car park. Coincidentally they lay almost directly under a roughly painted R on the tarmac. This had existed since the early 2000s to signify a reserved parking space. On 12 September, it was announced that the skeleton discovered during the search might be that of Richard III. Several reasons were given. The body was of an adult male. It was buried beneath the choir of the church, and there was severe scoliosis of the spine, possibly making one shoulder higher than the other. Additionally, there was an object that appeared to be an arrowhead embedded in the spine and there were paramortem injuries to the skull. These included a relatively shallow orifice, which is most likely to have been caused by a rondel dagger and a scooping depression to the skull, inflicted by a bladed weapon, most probably a sword. Additionally, the bottom of the skull presented a gaping hole where a halberd had cut away and entered it. Forensic pathologist, 
Dr. Stuart Hamilton stated that this injury would have left the king's brain visible and most certainly would have been the cause of death. Dr. Joe Appleby, the osteoarchaeologist who excavated the skeleton concurred and described the latter as immortal battlefield wound in the back of the skull. The base of the skull also presented another fatal wound in which a bladed weapon had been thrust into it leaving behind a jagged hole. Closer examination of the interior of the skull revealed a mark opposite this wound, showing that the blade penetrated to a depth of 10.5 cm. In total, the skeleton presented 10 wounds, 4 minor injuries on the top of the skull, 1 dagger blow on the cheekbone, 1 cut on the lower jaw, 2 fatal injuries on the base of the skull, one cut on a rib bone and one final wound on the king's pelvis most probably inflicted after death. It is generally accepted that post-mortem Richard's naked body was tied to the back of a horse, with his arms slung over one side and his legs and buttocks over the other. This presented a very opportunistic target for onlookers, and the angle of the blow on the pelvis suggests that one of them stabbed Richard's right buttock with substantial force as the cut extends from the back all the way to the front of the pelvic bone and was most probably an act of humiliation. It is also possible that Richard suffered other injuries which left no trace on the skeleton. In 2004 the British historian John Ashdown Hill had used genealogical research to trace matrilineal descendants of Anne of York, Richard's elder sister, a British-born woman who emigrated to Canada after the Second World War, Joy Ibsen was found to be a 16th-generation great-niece of the king in the same direct maternal line. Joy Ibsen's mitochondrial DNA was tested and belongs to mitochondrial DNA haplogroup J, which by deduction should also be the mitochondrial DNA haplogroup of Richard III. Joy Ibsen died in 2008. Her son Michael Ibsen gave a mouth swab sample to the research team on 24 August 2012. His mitochondrial DNA passed down the direct maternal line was compared to samples from the human remains found at the excavation site and used to identify King Richard. On 4 February 2013, the University of Leicester confirmed that the skeleton was beyond reasonable doubt that of King Richard III. This conclusion was based on mitochondrial DNA evidence, soil analysis, and dental tests as well as physical characteristics of the skeleton, which are highly consistent with contemporary accounts of Richard's appearance. The team announced that the arrowhead discovered with the body was a Roman-era nail probably disturbed when the body was first interred. However, there were numerous paramortem wounds on the body, and part of the skull had been sliced off with a bladed weapon. This would have caused rapid death. The team concluded that it is unlikely that the king was wearing a helmet in his last moments. Soil taken from the Plantagenet King's remains was found to contain microscopic roundworm eggs. Several eggs were found in samples taken from the pelvis where the king's intestines were but not from the skull and only very small numbers were identified in soil surrounding the grave. The findings suggest that the higher concentration of eggs in the pelvic area probably arose from a roundworm infection the king suffered in his life rather than from human waste dumped in the area at a later date, researchers said. The mayor of Leicester announced that the king's skeleton would be reinterred at Leicester Cathedral in early 2014, but a judicial review of that decision delayed the reinterment for a year. A museum to Richard III was opened in July 2014 in the Victorian school buildings next to the Greyfriars grave site. The proposal to have King Richard buried in Leicester attracted some controversy. Those who challenged the decision included 15 collateral, non-direct descendants of Richard, represented by the Plantagenet Alliance who believe that the body should be reburied in York as they claim the king wished 
In August 2013 they filed a court case in order to contest Leicester's claim to re-enter the body within its cathedral and propose the body be buried in York instead. However Michael Ibsen, who gave the DNA sample that identified the king gave his support to Leicester's claim to re-enter the body in the cathedral. On 20 August, a judge ruled that the opponents had the legal standing to contest his burial in Leicester Cathedral, despite a clause in the contract which had authorized the excavations requiring his burial there. He urged the parties though to settle out of court in order to avoid embarking on the Wars of the Roses Part II, the Plantagenet Alliance, and the supporting 15 collateral non-direct descendants also faced the challenge that basic maths shows Richard who had no surviving children, but five siblings could have millions of collateral descendants, and they don't represent the only people who can speak on behalf of him, as one member claimed. A ruling in May 2014 decreed that there are no public law grounds for the court interfering with the decisions in question. The remains were taken to Leicester Cathedral on the 22nd of March 2015 and reinterred on the 26th of March. On the 5th of February the 2013, Professor Caroline Wilkinson of the University of Dundee conducted a forensic facial reconstruction of Richard III commissioned by the Richard III Society. Based on 3D mappings of his skull, the face is described as warm young earnest, and rather serious. On the 11th of February 2014 the University of Leicester announced the project to sequence the entire genome of Richard III and one of his living relatives Michael Ibsen, whose mitochondrial DNA confirmed the identification of the excavated remains. Richard III thus became the first ancient person of known historical identity to have their genome sequenced. In November 2014 the results of the testing were announced confirming that the maternal side was as previously thought. The paternal side, however, demonstrated some variants from what had been expected with the DNA showing no links to the purported descendants of Richard's great-great-grandfather Edward III of England through Henry Somerset V, Duke of Beaufort. This could be the result of covered illegitimacy that does not reflect the accepted genealogies between Richard and Edward III and between Edward III and the 5th Duke of Beaufort. Reburial and Tomb In 1485 following his death in battle against Henry Tudor at Bosworth Field, Richard III's body was buried in Greyfriars Church in Leicester. Following the discoveries of Richard's remains in 2012 it was decided that they should be reburied at Leicester Cathedral. Despite feelings in some quarters that he should have been reburied in New York Minster, his remains were carried in procession to the cathedral on the 22nd of March 2015 and reburied on the 26th of March 2015 at a religious reburial service, at which both the Right Reverend Tim Stevens, the Bishop of Leicester, and the Most Reverend Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, officiated. The British royal family was represented by the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester and the Countess of Wessex. The actor Benedict Cumberbatch, who is a distant relation of the King, and later portrayed him in the Hollow Crown television series Read a Poem by poet laureate Carol Ann Durfee. His cathedral tomb was designed by the architects Van Henningen and Horwood. The tombstone is deeply incised with a cross and consists of a rectangular block of white Swaledale fossil stone quarried in North Yorkshire. It sits on a low plinth made of dark Hilkenny marble and incised with Richard's name dates and motto. The plinth also carries his coat of arms in Pietra Dura. The remains of Richard III are in a lead-lined coffin inside an outer English O coffin crafted by Michael Ibsen, a direct descendant of Richard's sister Anne of York.
and laid in a brick-lined vault below the floor and below the plinth and tombstone. The original 2010 raised tomb design had been proposed by Langley back, quote, S looking for Richard Project, and fully funded by members of the Richard III Society. The proposal was publicly launched by the Society on 13 February 2013 but rejected by Leicester Cathedral in favour of a memorial slab. However, following a public outcry, the cathedral changed its position and on 18 July 2013 announced its agreement to give King Richard III a raised tomb monument titled Styles and Honours. On 1 November 1461 Richard gained the title of Duke of Gloucester in late 1461. He was invested as a Knight of the Garter. Following the death of King Edward IV, he was made Lord Protector of England. Richard held this office from 30 April to 26 June 1483, when he made himself King of the Realm. As King of England, Richard was styled De Gratia Rex Angliae Franciae Dominus Hiberniae. Informally, he may have been known as Dickin according to a 16th century legend of a note. Warning of treachery that was sent to the Duke of Norfolk on the eve of Bosworth, Jack of Norfolk be not too bold, for Dickin, thy master is bought and sold. Arms As Duke of Gloucester Richard used the royal arms of England quartered with the royal arms of France differenced by a label argent of three-point sermon, on each point a canton gules supported by a blue boar. As sovereign, he used the arms of the kingdom undifferenced supported by a white boar and a lion. His motto was loyo me li loyalty binds me, and his personal device was a white boar. Brought to you by wikivd.com Would you like to know more?